Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy Handley. I work at the Ridgefield Library, um, coordinating the adult programs. And tonight, I'm very happy to bring you a wonderful program presented by Barb Jenis, <laughs> our beloved poet laureate, who just has a new book about to come out, a new chat book. What's it called, Barb? Loan. Um, it, well, it's a, that's the working title. It may okay. change because it's brand new. I mean, it's brand new to, to being accepted. So it'll be a while before things are final. Okay, well, congratulations on that. And we're very happy to have this group of poets who have written poems about the earth. Um, my birthday is on Earth Day, so I really like these poems. Uh -huh. um, so take it away, Barb. Introduce everyone. Thank you, Lucy. As always, thank you, Ridgefield Library, as always, for your great hospitality for poetry. Um, I just want to, before we, oh, and I want to also say, of course, happy National Poetry Month. Um, we're very excited to present tonight's program, Praise This Place, an Earth Day Poetry Celebration, featuring Connecticut eco-poets Luca Bordi, Dr. Jean Linville, Amy Noraki, and John Stenizzi. Um, before we begin, I just want to hype a couple of other right around the corner poetry events that we'll be hosting on Zoom. Um, on Wednesday, May 3rd, we'll air the May edition of Poems from Connecticut's Four Corners, featuring poets Ryan Clements, Marilyn Johnston, Jim Kelleher, Karen Warensky, and Christy Max Williams. It's going to be a, a, so another really wonderful lineup. Then on June 7th, <laughs> please tune in for a special Father's Day edition uh, where we have only father, father poets. We have Dennis Barone, Paul Bluestein, Chris Gaffney, Stephen Ostrowski, and John Surowiecki. So that's, you can register for both of those readings on the, the uh, Ridgefield Library website. Uh, we're gonna go quiet uh, for uh, poems for Connecticut, from Connecticut's Four Corners in July and August, but we'll return in September for more monthly readings by poets from throughout the straight state. Um, if you'd like to be added to our roster of poets, just send me an email. It's barbjenis at gmail.com. Be sure to include your town of residence because we do um, have a poet from each of the four corners plus the central Hartford region every, every month and include a brief bio. And we welcome poets of all, uh, at all levels of their career to, 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 well, you know, to be on the program. Then also, just quickly, on April 25th, the library will host an in-person poetry event featuring Ira Jo Fisher, who is the author of four books of poems and a collection of essays for an evening uh, of verse, uh, both his and others. And then while you're at the library, be sure to stop and get one of these wonderful Read More <laughs> Poems uh, stickers. They're available at the circulation desk, courtesy of moi. Um, help yourself to as many as you need. Um, and we're, we're so glad you're here. So now to tonight's program. We're going to, oh, before I go there, let me just mention, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, there's a wonderful collection um, called, I mean, you can see it, Waking Up to the Earth, uh, Connecticut's, um, Connecticut Poets in the Time of Global Climate Crisis, edited by our, uh, the state's Poet Laureate Emerita, Margaret Gibson. Many of the poets who are featured here this evening are included in the collection, plus so many other wonderful poems. It's available either through your local um, bookseller, or you can also order it directly from Grayson um, Books in Hartford, and West Hartford. So please check it out. Some amazing poets in there and, and wonderful earth-centered poetry. And thanks, thanks to Margaret Gibson for um, getting that collection, that anthology together during her tenure as our state poet laureate. Okay, so now back to tonight's program. We're going to begin tonight with Amy Noel Rocky, uh, who is the author of six poetry collections, most recently Mouth Brooders from 2019, which was a finalist for the 2020 um, Connecticut Book Award. Her work has appeared in many print and online publications, including the Connecticut River Review, Woven Tail Press, Sixfold, the Loft Poetry Anthology, Reckless Writing Anthology, and Wildness, Voices of the Sacred Landscape. Her nonfiction book, The Comet's Tale, A Memoir of No Memory, was a 2018 Forward Reviews Indies finalist for Best Memoir and has been awarded a gold medal for the Living Now Mind Body Spirits Award. Uh, she, Amy teaches English at the University of Bridgeport, where she is the Associate Dean of the College of Science and Society. Uh, she lives in Hamden, 
with her husband, Eric Lehman, who's here this evening, and their cat, Jangle, who I hope is also tuning in. Uh, you can visit, and I'll put this in the chat, the biography and also the link to Amy's website. Um, so you can um, see some of her other work besides what she'll read with us tonight, and then also um, connect with her directly. So Amy, take it away. Thank you so much, Barb and Lucy, for inviting me and uh, organizing this wonderful presentation. It's great to see so many uh, faces, familiar and unfamiliar, and I look forward to um, hearing everybody. I'm actually going to start with my poem. It's a little blurry there. Um, but we saw the cover um, when Barb held it up. This is from the anthology that was uh, published last year, but it's uh, still available. And I'm very honored to have been part of that. Um, this poem is called Arboriculture. So arboriculture is the study of trees. Um, and this poem focuses on a series of trees or the idea of trees um, and how we interact with the trees and their gifts to us. Arboriculture. I'm sure the red mulch spread beneath the dormant azalea has in its loamy peat the macerated remnants of a massive Louisiana cypress. I know it in my bones. Somewhere in the swamps of Atchafalaya, an ancient colossus towering hundreds of feet was felled with the unheard echo of a stolen temple bell. The harvested trophy died again at the mill, chomped to confetti by the grimacing false teeth of a machine. I suffer the russet sin with my arms elbow deep in agriculture as I distribute the ground cover around sweet william and verbena blossoms in the front yard. I'm hardly as wicked with those. Their plastic trays were purchased from the farm stand where tiny, ripe, organic strawberries melted like wine lozenges in my mouth. I spit the pits out the car window on the drive home. But I am wicked to the core and today the supermarket is closer to the mail drop and the library where mediocre books half read are overdue. And those bags of dirty fill stacked on the concrete walkway near the store seem so utilitarian so earthy and convenient. Plus, I hate the weeds, which the bag promises to squelch, and the neighbor with her elegant foxgloves and blooming geraniums is really the one to blame for this. But I cannot loose the swamp cypresses from my mind. These conifers, these sacred fellows holding the soil in with their gracious roots, exhaling with delicate silence. I feel like God doling out the floodwaters, my bloody hands handsomely disguised by garden gloves. I am a fraud, a pirate, and when the levees break again, I will sink into counterfeit soil and drown. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is, I hope, a little bit of an antidote to that. Um, you know, I do, th I've been doing some seeding right now, and I think about my relationship to the things I'm putting into the ground. I, I hope we all think about that. But I do, you know, we do, we do wonder where, where the soil comes from when we take it from a bag at Home Depot or whatever. Um, but this is a poem, another poem with Counter with Nature. Um, it's based on a hike that I took uh, many years ago now, but um, it's about the bees that I ran into or stumbled into. It's called Other Devils. Once the bees ignite under my feet, a brotherhood is sealed, a secret handshake, a vendetta, the spiraling pinpricks of worthy swords, each sting an announcement. Like affable torturers, they know enough of pain to stop once the confession has been achieved. What lasts is not the sting, not the swell of implanted knobs from the end of lightning sparks, not even the ache that spotted a few honest branches of my body. No, what lasts is the internal honey, a shared fear, theirs, Entrapment 
instinctual, ancient and worthy of blooming now and again. Mine, the dewy awareness of having awakened their sting by my stumbling, the disregard for sacred land, my foolishness for thinking hives harbored only in trees, beneath the overhangs of old houses, in the compartments and symmetry of the beekeeper's chambers. And when the melee ends, I am not killed. I am not frozen or left bloody on the path. They retreat or else are banished by my struggle, arms swinging, the flight of legs, a few heart-shaped tears, a plea or two. But I will carry their venom past the edge of the forest. Soon the snow of a long winter will encourage hibernation. Soon I too will sleep venom soaked, loving the beauty of their defense, the swiftness of the attack and the humbling victory. In my failure, I kneel, blessed, honey full, immune to other devils. It's about that time when the, the, the bees start, start doing what bees do and um, never been afraid of bees um, and I, I know that some are legitimately that their sting can be dangerous but um, I, I felt the experience of having run into them and being attacked just left me with a sense of awe um, and that's what I look look to nature to, to renew that awe as much as possible I think that awe will help us help us get through but we do encounter nature in ways that we um, sometimes recognize and realize and, and have that sense of greatness. Um, this is another encounter with some um, things around the house. These are birds um, that nest, where birds nest, and sometimes that's convenient and sometimes it's not. Um, this is, these last two poems are from my collection, Four Blue Eggs, and this is the title poem, Four Blue Eggs. Mother Robin sits impatiently under the clothesline. Inchworm and beak returns to her bundle only when the large figure that looms above the timber of a false tree abandons curiosity, tiptoeing away in stillness. Day by day, this foreigner monitors the progress of the four blue eggs, sneaking peeks through thin slats of the deck, the nest settled on a rafter underneath. Before the hatching, Roundness obscures the odd disaster of pre-birth, squished into shells, formlessly foretelling little of future wings. Their understudy <clears throat> anxiously goes about her gardening, gathering dry, paralyzed insects from between the loose petals of a marigold, taking them with her through the sliding door. In hours, it seems, their beaks open in curious diamonds, unfeathered and sloppily pink. The four breathe in unison, awaiting their next meal. Their winged mother reclaims them obediently. Abandoning the fledglings is not easy. Unattended by a camera's eye, unnoted in a field guide or baby book, they'll lose their dinosaur shape too quickly and disappear into style feathers and wormholes. Despite the surrogacy she has lent them, the watcher knows their first takeoff will go ahead without her, before goodbyes are settled, before her own feathers are wide enough for, that, for them to flourish under. We're lucky enough to have other places that the, the birds can nest, and uh, one of the greatest joys of spring is to see them just watch them day by day. Um, okay. I'm going to read um, a pair of poems. Uh, they're paired. Um, one is a response to another. And the first one is actually from, um, by my, my good friend, and I know many of us on the Zoom knew him as well, David K. Leff, who passed away um, uh, almost a year ago, sadly. Uh, his uh, collection, The Blue Marble Gods of Here, um, came out after his, his death, but um, I, wa I had read the manuscript and I rem didn't remember a poem until I was thinking about David. And um, 
the poem came back to me through my own um, reflections of how I would talk to David. And so the first poem that I'm going to read is his poem called Texture of Silence. And then the poem that I wrote for him is um, a response to both his poem and to him and, my, um, and our shared love of nature. This is David K. Leff's poem, Texture of Silence. A lichen-patched boulder is the texture of silence I long to emulate. I want to melt into the landscape, forget the surveyor, and yield to the survey of oaks and pines, sparkling schist, schist and red sandstone. I yearn to be camouflaged, an unseen sensation like wind on my cheek or the stream chattering in my ears. Distilled to an essence, I'd find a place where prayers expand forever, like the air I breathe. And this poem is called Textures and Silences. And one of the things that um, David certainly shared was his love of um, Henry David Thoreau. And part of the poem came through a trip that um, my husband Eric and I took to Walden. Um, and all of this came together in this poem. Textures and Silences for David K. Leff. I rummage in the cornfield between Emerson and Thoreau next to the Concord Ice House, a path we both have traveled. I'd like to trace strands of corn silk and melt into the chrysalis of husks around ears of corn surrounded in the texture of silence. Had we asked each other in the conventional way, you would have laughed and added, the ears are listening to the texture of silence. I yearn for the camouflage of whatever falls after harvest and is burnt by heat unpicked tassels of knotted silk, what crows and black bears cannot get to. This falling, I give to you. I feel it feathering like ice crystals on a cold surface, touch tuned to the key of moonlight, the texture of breath we mimic in human conversation. From you, I take the texture of soil, it's detritus of life, fueling the height and heft of future husks, future ears, future listening. I need a couple more. This one um, is called Oak Storm. And um, a couple years ago, um, I mean, I live in Hamden, and uh, we've had some interesting <laughs> recent weather with hurricanes and a tornado even. Um, and this was one of those interesting, weird, and a little scary, but also kind of awesome uh, spring storm. It's called Oak Storm. It's been like this for a while now, waiting for storms to pass over. The end of winter brought no snow. The end of spring brought no rain. The waiting brought no end to the wait. The storm tracked its lovely radar in predictable spirals of yellow and red. And perennial thunder waited too, like a criminal, not yet detectable except to weathered men and beasts underground. And when the squall began its quarreling, the oaks began to shake away the August heat and leave the waiting to the rest of us. They fell together, leaves twined like bundled magazines, glossy and unselfconscious, their color print pages so full of summer, so unperturbed by the descent. There were too many to name, eastern white oak, northern red oak, black oak, Mossy cup oak, chestnut oak, shrub oak, swamp oak, scarlet oak. Veins still plump, leaf blades leathery, like the shed skin of snake gods who fear the rain. At the end of waiting, I gather as many as I can and carry 
as many as I can carry, and I bury them in the pages of frail human books. I need so badly to hold in their storm scent, to remember Petrichor, the weight of wind now quiet, the electricity of their dark Eden green, so green, green like the sound of thunder, just as the earth breaks its fall. And I'm gonna finish with a poem, um, also about birds. Um, this one has a more late summer feel to it for me. Um, I haven't seen the ravens yet, but I'm sure they'll be out soon. Uh, this poem is called Ravens of West Rock. Along the Along the ridge, the old Baldwin Parkway lays the augury of lost asphalt. But I trek over the nearby trail, preferring the variability of stepping stones and scrub oaks, forging a straight path of buzzing mosquitoes for the low chuckle of unseen birds. Unknowingly, I turn them into grouse and turkey, then predict crow forms unaccustomed to the throaty mechanical gurgle of these new calls. Ears betray them before eyes do. Emerging from the blazes, I see their outlines stenciled on high tension wires, scanning the valley and screaming at my intrusion. Big as hawks, burly as storks, they circle, landing with deliberation on iron trees. In my feet, I feel their cronks and craw, 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 vibrate and settle in the cloudless day. I follow their cries with my eyes. I want to distinguish them from others, prove my ornithology, to understand the echo of black and the vision of voices tactile in their cacophony. I watch as they, as I watch, they turn into metaphors. Witches whose wings signal the purple of bruises. Demons kin, fit for gothic poems and graveyards. The nest is nearby. The mother is angry. Spells are cast. They are, after all, soul devourers who tear me apart with their darkness who send me back to the forest, wanting evermore to be one of them. I think I'll, I'll finish it with that one. Appreciate everybody being here. Wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Amy. I had a couple of lines just grabbed me. I had to write them down. The pinpricks of worthy swords when you were discussing the bees. That's, that's um, Thank you, a kind way of it. <laughs> Also, the, the beaks of the baby birds open in curious diamonds, just beautiful language. And also, thank you for mentioning David K. Leff. Um, he's kind of a, a hero to us here in Ridgefield. He, when he was at the DEB, um, helped to conserve uh, 460 acres uh, here in Ridgefield as open, perpetual open space in perpetuity. So um, he did good, great things for us in Ridgefield. So Thank you, Barbara, for, for for letting us know about that. That's really great. Appreciate it. Okay, next up we have a Louis Gabordi. And by the way, I want to apologize. A lot of the materials that were posted, I had misspelled Lou's last name. There is no second R. It's Gabordi, not Gar Garbordi. So I apologize, Lou. Um, Lou is a retired educator and mentor to young poets. A member of the Westerly Rhode Island Savoy Poetry Salon, he has shared his work in Southern Connecticut and Southern Rhode Island. Or so, yeah. um, Lou's work has been recognized by the New Millennium Writing Awards and published in this wonderful anthology, Waking Up to the Earth, Connecticut Poets in a Time of Global Climate Crisis, and also in the Connecticut River Review. Uh, nothing so informs Lou's work as his love and concern for the natural world uh, he lives in Yed Ledger with his wife, fellow poet, and retired educator, Catherine D'Annunzio. So welcome, Lou. Oh, you might have to unmute yourself. 
How's that? Okay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you, Barb and Lucy, for putting this together and all the wonderful poetry that's coming out of Ridgefield, the Ridgefield Public Library. The, the Four Corners poets have been wonderful. I look forward to the, the next installments of them. The first poem I'll read is also from Waking Up to the Earth. It's called Fox December Snow. A limping fox is hunting on the hill below the cliffs on a morning made more lovely by an early winter snow. She moves two legs and hops across the white. Her head is cocked and low as she listens for the mice that scratch and gather on the hidden ground. I have seen her hunting many times, switching back along the slope and pausing at the piles of brush I leave for warmth and cover every autumn. Her arrival after dawn should be less surprising, less remarkable by now. But fur, the color of wood fire, is always unexpected. I want to think she'll heal before her hunger and the cold can do her in. What happens to a fox? I hear the fisher screaming like a child from time to time. And a bobcat hunts these woods again and will not tolerate a fox. Can a dying vole inflict a wound that festers? Or was it something tamer? a hidden stem of thorns? Do even foxes slip on icy rocks and turn an ankle? The natural world is pushing me again to challenge my assumptions, to reconsider who and what I am. Am I a man who would, if she'd allow it, wrap her in a tattered towel and lay her in a basket? There is a place not far from here where people know about these things and understand what mercy is for injured foxes. If I found her lying on her side, saw her ribcage pulsing through her fur, could I ignore the fear that rose with every step as I approached? Could I endure the fetid air of animal necrosis, control my thoughts and hands to give her what I think she needs? Or is my companion, my compassion, better left? untested, and merely what a well-fed man can summon in a heated room. Nothing is resolved before she finishes, decides there's nothing here for her, and struggles up the hill into the beach and maples. As she moves along the naked saplings by the stony ledge, stripes of shadow and the sifted copper sun obscure and then reveal her. When she pauses, I can see no sign of weakness, just an undiminished fox's wild beauty. She waits as though she understands her stillness at a distance is itself an act of kindness, warm, flowing down the hill and pooling at my feet. Um, just very briefly, in most of my nature poems, um, someone is encountering nature, bringing their questions, making their observations, drawing some conclusions, which often get reflect back on them. And the uh, first poem was an example of that. And most of them, uh, that's the case. This is vultures. This distance seems sufficient to study them in flight. I stop my truck beside the field as I have often thought I would, to watch its wake of vultures climb in circle. They float at different heights, and I wonder if, here as well, a protocol is understood. Some ride the thermal clockwise, others counter, and I see subtler differences in proficiency and style. Why is this one's gliding smooth, while that one dips a wing and wobbles more than others? From above, they must seem planetary, or nearly so, meshing gears, wheels within wheels. It's said they form a kettle when aloft, a simmering pot of air they stir. Toil and trouble comes to mind, as if what's needed here is yet another metaphor evoking darkness. But what I see this afternoon could pass for celebration, a sweeping dance against the sky 
in gratitude for being, communal soaring filled with light. Were I a joyous spirit rising, I might follow such a path as theirs, opened armed and sailing, slipping toward the sun. This is the first that I have seen. Turns into a bit of a prayer at the end. Below the morning's fading moon, an owl falls out of shadows, floats soundlessly through 20 yards of light and disappears into the woods, here and gone. There will be no encore. These perfect seconds of daylight owl, the timing of my presence and chance attentiveness will not tumble into place again. <clears throat> but instead of gliding with him, instead of being still, I focus on the stripes below his breast to say his name, Bard Owl, as he leaves for deeper shade. My recurring foolishness, obscuring with words a raptor's silent sweep, when a quiet heart would bring me deep into the moment, to a breath that catches in my throat. A family of foxes emerging from their burrow in the brush. The fragrant shock of wild grapes trailing down a slope, curled beneath the final sticks of firewood, a torpid ribbon snake. Let me come to each encounter simply. Let nature wake the child I was, to be purely awed or fearful. Make each owl the first that I have seen. Uh, after us, the next poem uh, was also in Waking Up to the Earth. When the fever breaks, time will pass as it always has, in rising and ebbing tides of light, tireless and without pause, indifferent to what remains and what has gone. However sudden or slow our leaving, no one can say this patient earth will not again be paradise. She may in only decades heal her lesser wounds. The abraded plains will green again in summers, their tall grasses teeming with the urgent labors and intrigues of whatever creatures may survive us. The blistered beds of siphoned marshes will melt and breathe again beneath dark tea water. Gravity, relentless as time, will buckle the rusting bones of buildings rising through the clouds and snap the careful arcs of bridges until stone and steel release and rain on everything below. Metallic moons, blind and silent in decaying orbits, will fall into the sea. And when our peculiar noises, latent in the hovering bronze of tower bells, and fuel tanks waiting for a jagged spark are heard a final time. And when the elemental dust that was our bodies is taken by the wind, neither sound nor scent will remain of us to trigger flight. And the last trace of encoded wariness of a lost species will disappear from the blood of the staggering fawn. It will be as if we never were at all. Something, uh, at least with portions that are a little lighter, uh, this is suburban variation. A Cooper's hawk has joined us and waits atop a dogwood, the one adorned with several of our feeders. Chickadees and finches hop between their breakfast and the cloud of butter yellow blossoms. These little ones must understand he hasn't come for them. They fuss among themselves as if today were any other morning. But on the ground below, morning doves are pecking at bits of seed and suet as the early sun ignites the iridescence of their breasts. I won't condemn a hawk for doing what it must, but I am saddened when confronted by the act. Which dove will be the first to go? Are there differences among them 
too subtle for my eye, but decisive to the hawk. No matter, my wife is having none of it. Out she rushes past the garden in her robe, brandishing whatever weapon she could snatch along the way, which is what, a dish towel, and shouting at the hawk until the branches spring beneath him as he lifts and flies away. Back inside the kitchen, her jaw cannot unclench itself. I thank her on behalf of every dove along the shoreline for bringing one more predator to reflect upon his choices. She counters by insisting we bear responsibility for imperiling the doves. Aren't we the ones who lure them here? Aren't we the ones who make them easy targets? She's right, of course. Still, a hawk is waiting somewhere, innocent as any dove, his hunger unaccounted for in our suburban variation of evolution's plan. I am grateful when a sudden hummingbird arrives to change the subject. He sips from potted morning glories, pink and purple on the deck. Later in the day, my wife is lost in reading in the stream of sunlight falling through the western window. I find a dustpan and a rake and secret them outdoors to clear below the dogwood. Gathering tufts of down and feathers of surprising hues for doves, bluish grays and pink, I scan the scene for other evidence. Not the smallest scrap of flesh, not a single hollow bone. Um, the poem I will end with is actually the first poem in a six poem series. Um, this one stands on its own, I think. And it features uh, the musings of an elderly farmer whose formal education is limited, but his determination to observe uh, the world around him, both the people and the natural world, um, is unlimited. Um, it's, uh, I will tell you that uh, this is. This poem comes out of, I was born in Southern New Jersey in an area of about 500 small farms. And um, he is somewhat uh, a composite of a number of the farmers that I know. And uh, um, so I would tell you, it's the farmer speaks of evening and it starts mid sentence. And the way the light changes is a little different from one day to the next. The colors coming up and fading, sounds too brighter or a little muffled. Sometimes I'm about to come in near dusk and the clouds are thin gray stones against the pink and pale blue. And Venus is the only other thing up there. Then the swallows come and even Martins when I used to have gourds out. When the first bat flits low above me, it's like the light is dancing away. And it is a dance. Peepers and Katie did sing, crickets, then bullfrogs get started in the swamp, and I'm tired and hungry, but I can barely get myself to walk up to the house. It feels like all of it, Venus, the clouds, the colors, everything flying and all the music is the answer to something, maybe everything. Maybe it's the answer if we can figure out the question, find words for it, or could be the answer and question are the same. I can't explain it yet. Years ago, I used to find arrowheads when I disc, and I think about the Lenapes and how they must have loved the music too, and their children would have fallen asleep to it. And I know what happened wasn't right. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I never thought to give back any land. How could I? But sometimes at night, I wonder if maybe they knew what the question is. And that's really all God wants. So he lets some piece of them stay. And I can almost feel them here, coming to the edge of the woods at dusk, secret is dear, waiting for me to leave. Thank you so much for having me and for all of you who have tuned in to listen. Oh, thank you, Lou. That was beautiful. Um, the, the poem about the fox in December snow, just, oh, just, just gorgeous. Um, I also wrote down the line, um, my wonderful metrical line, it will be as if we never were at all. I mean, I kind of hope that's the ultimate fate of our earth. Um, and I'd love, I have to say, 
I'm a new fan of your wife running after the hawk with a dish down. Yeah, you go, girl. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of that response to the phone. Oh, yeah. yeah. I once went after a, a man who poached a deer from behind our house in, my, in the middle of winter in the snow in my pajamas and bare feet. So <laughs> I'm with her. Anyway. Okay. Um, let me just pull up the next slide. Thank you, Lou. Beautiful Thank reading. You. And next up, actually, our next two poets have projects that are very similar in some respects. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. But um, next up, we have Jean Linville. Um, Jean is an ecologically minded visual artist, writer, and native plant enthusiast. Jean has previously had poems published in Whole Terrain, Poor Yorick, and the anthology Tree Magic, More Extraordinary Encounters with Trees. Her work as a visual artist has appeared in both solo and group exhibitions throughout New Jersey and uh, New York, sorry, sorry, and Connecticut. In fact, it was one last year at the Ridgefield Library, a beautiful exhibit of Jean's and others' arts. Um, Jean holds a PhD in interdisciplinary studies from uh, Union Institute and University, an MA in fine arts and arts education from Vermont College at Norwich University, and a BS in art education from SUNY at Buffalo. Additionally, Jean has been involved with the Ecotype Project at the Hickory's Organic Farm here in Ridgefield since its inception, a really exciting program of, of developing and, and, and cultivating um, uh, plants that are perfect for this, for this eco, ecosystem that we have here in this particular zone, which I hope uh, Jean will talk about more. Uh, you want to definitely want to check out Jean's uh, photography and verse at her website, which I'll put up in the chat. Um, she has a wonderful 72 seasons um, approach to, to what happens in our world, and I hope she'll talk about that a little bit. So Jean, take it away. Thank you, Barb. Um, and, I, and I thank you for this uh, invite to be part of this group. Um, it's, it's a wonderful evening so far. So uh, I'm going to start um, just a little bit of an explanation of what I've been up to for the last three years. Um, I've really been focusing just on the property where we live, which is about a third of an acre in Ridgefield. So on, in most people's view, it's a very small property. Um, and what I've been working on is trying to develop the biodiversity there. And through those measures, trying to really get to know what's here and all of the little micro ecosystems that exist within this third of an acre. So um, most of <clears throat> all of my work for the last three years um, with my visual art and with my poetry has revolved on pulling inspiration from this third of an acre. And um, when we think about our properties, we do tend to think of them as having seasons to them. And for the most part, we've been kind of conditioned to think about four seasons. So what I wanted to do is I, I'm first gonna share four poems that take us through the four seasons that most of us normally think of. And <clears throat> the first one will start in spring, where we are now, and it'll, it, it brings up uh, something that I think we're all experiencing right now. So um, elusive. Brown flower stalks and textured pods stand still in the garden bereft. Blink. Seeds are released to the warming ground. Tight buds open, unfurling tender leaves. Blink again. Silver catkins burst with blooms, offering the first of spring's seductive scents. Nectar to ravenous flies and bees. The full strawberry moon floats somewhere high above, hidden by the bright morning sky, while lessons of patience settle around the wings of a solitary great blue heron. And now moving into fall. Tug of war. Swamp milkweeds seemingly sense the loosening grip of the sun's warmth, opening their pods sending seeds aloft on a building wind that is pulling the weather further from summer as chlorophyll gives way to a raging storm of yellows, oranges, and reds, splashed with abandon on the nearby hills and garden tools cleaned, oiled, and hung with care 
bang against the wall of the shed protesting their retirement as a strong gust laden with leaves rounds the corner darkening the sky with heavy clouds slashing rain and promises of a cold night to come evaporation of time the snow is still falling at an impressive rate taking a break from shoveling i head inside protesting muscles relaxing into a chair nestled next to a space heater as i check to see if any birds are venturing out cardinals wrens sparrows and juncos make quick visits to the feeders deftly hopping on deep drifts I get lost in the quiet beauty of a morning dove facing into the storm checkered wing ruffled flight feather tawny brown washed here and there stunning variations of color visible against the bright white snow the gentle bird repositions settles and closes its pale blue eyelids against the feathery flakes that have now coated the driveway once again so those are our four seasons but really what i've been doing for the past three years is breaking the year into even more seasons when i uh, was working on the exhibition that barb mentioned for the ridgefield library i was doing a 12 panel piece um, and so i thought oh i'll have a panel for every month and i'll be able to capture everything that's happening <laughs> on that one panel you know how naive we are day after day and what i realized that it was nowhere near what was happening um, in my little world of this third of an acre and so I started doing some research and I discovered that there is a, a very old philosophy um, out of a Chinese culture still being practiced in a lot of the Japanese cultures, whereupon they believe that there are 70, 72 seasons in a year. Each one is approximately five days long. And so I thought that this was much more plausible than four seasons or even 12 seasons and so i set about um seeing if i could pay attention and, and find those differences and so as i said for for three years that's exactly what i've been doing is every five days i kind of assess what's been going on and and listen to the land and listen to uh, the creatures that are here and and try to pick up on what's happening and so the next um four poems that i'm going to read are actually follow four five day seasons so it'll start um uh, actually like this week equivalent which is in april 20th and it will end up at the beginning of may so these are four seasons in a row kin i lean into the curve of the tree's trunk both of us warmed by the morning sun and the songs of birds whose names i have learned and forgotten then made my own happy tail bobber rhapsody in orange and soft floating whisperer rooted in place tree and human take in the throbbing pulses of life cycles reverberating through a raft of bubbles accompanied by two snapping turtles thrashing underwater and the brilliance of marsh marigold blooms familiar rhythms repeated and repeated creating room for assurances and hope breeding understanding of self and others and the next one is just a very short <laughs> three lines ferns unfurl towards hope orioles the afternoon has coaxed a musk turtle to pull itself out of the chilly waters up onto a warm half submerged log to bask beneath newly emerged birch catkins seeming to sway with a lilting song that is floating on the breeze for the first time as brilliant flashes of orange fly overhead
complementary. Three leaf clovers and scarlet maple leaves spring to life. So that literally spans just 20 days. And yet there are these segments that stand alone where there were key things that were happening that didn't happen in the prior five days and are changing and morphing into something else in the next five days. Um, and, and I've just continued to be fascinated by it. And, and now what it's becoming is almost a study of phenology of looking at, you know, what things are happening concurrently, what triggers the sign of something else coming. And so, um, that's kind of the scope that I'm looking at things with now. And um, the last piece that I'll close with is a, is a newer piece. And it relates to me thinking about phenology, but then also genealogy, <laughs> all the ologies. Um, and, the, and the fact of looking at, you know, what makes us who we are? I mean, we're quick to assume it's our genetics or that it's, you know, the culture in which we were raised. Um, but from a molecular standpoint, you can really argue that really who you are is a combination of everything that you breathe in, that your body comes in contact with, and that um, it, that changes you in some way. So um, this will be my, my closing piece called Genetics of Place. We talk of being born of varying mixtures of our parents' genome, featureless forms floating in the nutrient-rich water of our mother, absorbing internal influences until emerging beneath the breadth of the cosmos. We ponder how much of Luna's form and the alignment of the stars and planets pulled and prodded our molecules into destiny still unknown. A waning crescent moon greeted me during the autumnal equinox while you rode the light of summer's waxing gibbous. We question, are we a small expression of everything? Tree covered hillsides that cradled us, river that flowed over and under us, dirt that seeped through jeans into our knees, the song of chickadees and silky feel of salamanders, and the taste of life coursing through a cold glass of cider. We acknowledge the pull of a particular landscape and the sense of home that is felt when sitting beneath the boughs of a large pine tree, body relaxing into the luxurious smell, anchored by the warmth of the earth while stirred by the wonder of the skies above. Thank you, Jean. Wow. Thank you. I, and I, I do, I encourage people to go to Jean's website and, and see, because not only does she do a piece of verse every five days, but she also takes a picture. And there, it's just a wonderful series. Jean, can people subscribe to that, to your blog? Um, they can. I mean, to be, all, to be honest, I haven't updated it in a while because I've been really kind of going through and reviewing everything that I've done for three years and I'm trying to, you know, kind of work on some kind of a compilation that I can do something with. Um, but yeah, you can go in and you can see what I've done in the past. And um, if anybody wants more information, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, it's a fascinating thing to try to start paying attention to um, wherever you live. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I think we have a happy tail bobber visiting our feeders, too. <laughs> we have the question mark bird that goes, whoop. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but it's the question mark bird. So <laughs> it's much easier to remember those names than all the other ones. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I think, um, I, don't, I don't know if our next poet um, will be sharing some work from um, a similar sort of project that he was working on. But let me just... Let me read the next biography here. John L. Spinizzi is the author of 12 books of poetry, most recently Feathers and Bone from 2020, just recent, very recent, and then Pond, P-O-N-D, 
a series of photographs and four line acrostic poems using the letters, of course, P O N D, um, that record his keen observations made on daily journey, journeys to a pond near his home. Uh, John's poetry has appeared in American Life and Poetry, curated by Ted Kozer, the New York Quarterly, Tar River Poetry, Rattle, Prairie Schooner, and many others. His work has been translated into Italian, which I think is so cool, and appears widely in Italy. In 1998, John was named the New England Poet of the Year by the New England Association of Teachers of English. And also, John's nonfiction has also been widely published. Um, a former Wesleyan University Etherington scholar, John has been an adjunct professor of English at Manchester Community College here in Connecticut for 26 years while teaching full time at Bacon Academy in Colchester, Connecticut. He lives in Coventry with his wife, Carol, who I assume also chases hawks with dish towels. And you can visit his website at the, at the link I'll put in the chat. So welcome, welcome, John. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, uh, it's such a joy to be here, period. Um, <laughs> but it's also such a joy to be here because it almost uh, uh, didn't happen. Now, uh, these days, the driving for me um, is a chore. And and it was just it was just too far. And um, suddenly, um, Barb did some magic, and here we are. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm really so grateful for that. Um, I, I I wasn't really planning on doing anything from Pond, but but this is the, uh, this is it. Um, and it was it was done over the course of a year, and <clears throat> there. You know, you get to around day 250 and you're like, I can't quit now. I, that would be just horrible, you know. Uh, uh, and so I, I did it. I didn't miss a day in 365 days. So um, I'll just give you an, I'll just open randomly and give you an idea of, of, what, um, <clears throat> of what it's like for all those pages. Um, let's see. Okay. So it begins with the uh, the date, the time, and uh, the degrees. So this was um, seven nine nineteen. It was eight oh six in the morning, and it was sixty five degrees. Um, and it, it is indeed an acrostic P O N D. Pale and exhausted today, malady of my own means. This aperos walk to the pond is wearisome. I feel the nimity, the unlikelihood that I will see this to the end, yet deep-seated surface is clear, and two goldfinches rise and fall across the reflection. So when it goes on and on like that, um, uh, and I thought I would do something that I haven't done in, in a really long time, and that is um, uh, read some poems from um, from older books. I'm just trying to reset my um, timer so I don't take up so much time. So um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, <clears throat> what is... Uh, uh, my third book uh, it was called uh, Dance Against the Wall, and Lou did a poem that reminded me very much of some of the things that are going on in this poem, which is called um, Fawn. And I wrote this just after reading that um, uh, if, um, if Mommy Fawn decides to go out foraging, uh, she'll sort of bed the fawn down in a specific place. And that little fellow will stay there and not move until his mother comes back. And um, I, I thought that was uh, wonderful. It begins with an epigraph from Elizabeth Bishop's The Pink Dog. She says, a depilated dog would not look well. Dress up, dress up and dance at carnival. Fun. In the carnival of lights and shadows at dawn, a small bony dog stands in the road. Elizabeth's dog, watching me curiously from the center line, so I slow for her, 
and then I see the dabs of softened white. Her right ear twitches a wary, cautious twitch, and she lopes into the woods, leaving me with a sense of joy at seeing this tiny fawn. But just as I am about to leave, I hear her squawk and see her just behind the scrub at the side of the road where she is watching me, her wise and fearful eyes too big for her. What are you doing, I say, and where is your mother? She hears my voice and steps back onto the road. Looking me straight in the eye, she bleats a question. But before I can respond, another car comes speeding by, and off she runs for good, before I even have a chance to say that I would lie down with her in the woods while she slept, sheltered on a nest of leaves. And when her mother returned, then I would go, having kept her safe from the likes of me. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and then from my first book, uh, a poem called Mole. I didn't know anything about moles except they destroyed my lawn. <laughs> um, but my uh, my kitties would always tell me where they were. You know, I uh, the the cats would sort of make a circle around this moving, this undulating pile of dirt, and they were saying to me, uh, Johnny. There it is. And so um, I I, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I got one of those things that you stick in the ground so that when the mole bumps into it, it's hideous. It drives a spike through his head. And after I thought about that, I said, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I thought of my own idea, which was to buy some heavy duty gloves because I didn't know whether they would bite me or not. And the two little garden shovels and i read that they were on the slow side moving forward but going back through their tunnels they would go at breakneck speed so what i did and i also learned that they can uh, swim like in the water as well as they can tunnel underground they love water insects and those those feet are like flippers um so I, I got two garden shovels, and when the cats told me that the, the mice, the mice, the moles were moving, I put a, a shovel where I thought his back was, and I put a shovel where I thought his front was, and I had him trapped. He couldn't go forward, and he couldn't go backwards, and then I would just dig him up and pick him up by the tail and uh, bring him down to the pond and put them in the pond and watch them swim away. And uh, so rather than kill them, I treated them to the pond. Um, so this is called Mole. You make the earth move, undulate, crack, and separate, as you decide without looking on the path you need to follow. And you go it alone, excavating a hill of fine, smooth soil, you dive in, etching a topographical map of your travels, a course, meandering, reflection of your journeys, swimming through earth, bald arms, stubby flippers, stroking in search of succulents, snug beneath the surface. And when you're sated, you come up knowing there is sustenance everywhere, in the rich, dark tunnels within and in the luscious summer air, when the flowers of your face blossom into light. Okay, I, I am. I'm, I'm going to read a couple from the from the new book. I, I have a tendency to make up forms, <laughs> and I, uh, um, uh, and it's really fun to do that. And this is this is one of those books. It's. Um, um, Every two poems in the book um, really is actually, uh, they belong together. The first poem and the second poem are, are a couple. The first poem is a garland, which is um, six synquains, but the sixth one 
uh, comprises the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, and fifth line of the first five stanzas. So, so the sixth stanza has to somehow make sense. Um, and then the and then the second poem in the group is uh, is a guzzle, which I uh, which I found extremely challenging. But a good friend of mine, um, <clears throat> who's expert. Uh, taught me, tutored me. Um, and so, so it's really a call and response book. And um, uh, I'll start with um, uh, a pair of poems. The first one is called Snag, and the second is called Self-Portrait as a Snag. A snag is a big, huge, dead tree, hollowed out, full of woodpecker holes, um, oftentimes no branches, certainly no leaves. It's a big dead tree, but they're crucial to the economy because of the uh, large number of animals, insects, uh, bugs, birds that, that live in them, and, and so we need to protect them. Um, so this, this is called snags, and the epigraph is woodpeckers roost and nest in cavities. As evening falls, woodpeckers head for the cavity they excavated specifically for roosting purposes. Nesting and roosting cavities are usually only slightly bigger than the width of the bird and can be as much as 11 degrees warmer than the outside temperature. Um, so here is snags. <clears throat> January grasps the snag and with straps of cold blasts, cracks the late tree weathering for centuries millennia, den tree, for generations of squirrels and raccoons, egrets rookery, perch for birds that hunt. Zagodactyl traction, a contraption in action, coming and going, chiseling a hole that makes me think of the man moth, of Elizabeth's moon, that tiny tear in the sky through which you'll slip your small head. You start, discard, start, revise, start, devise before your last choice. Finally, there is a little flask shaped shelter, six by nine, nestled under a leaning branch, protected from the wind and rain and me. By the time the nurse log starts to nurture, she is long dead and returning to earth, birthing seedlings, lichens, mosses, these young where she has fallen, growing up and down, up to the air, down into the precious earth. Roosting holes in snags where branches become nurse logs, microcosmic prophets, which draw us into the notion that there is pure grace in feeding that breathing desire, that urge to love the living and the dead. January grasps the snag, and with straps in action, coming and going, chisels a little flask-shaped shelter six by nine, where she has fallen, growing up and down, urged to love both the living and the dead. And then, so the the um, the it's it's a partner poem is called "Self Portrait as a Snag" because um, my birthday is next week, and I'm pretty old. <laughs> I can't I can't even believe how old I am. Um, and so I um, so I um, it's a really weak. <laughs> transparent metaphor, but I am actually the snag uh, in this poem. So it's self-portrait as the snag. A snag in the midst of the heat of late summer, my old bones grow hollow in the freight of summer. Cold loneliness, the air out the winter window, slow burn of snow, oh, please don't hesitate summer. My back has grown tired. My hands are getting cold as weather winters surely through the straits of summer. 
So many of you have gone before me this year in fall, February, and then the chaste summer. The window behind the altar, massive, opened, the hand of God behind clouds, unlaced by summer. The sun crashed up on the basement of the up in the basement of the white church where smooth jazz and lies were not the fate of summer. Staniz, you've been haunting the same road forever, your old heart passing into cicada summer. And then a, a, a couple more. I, um, um, we have a little shed which uh, sits underneath our deck and every year um the swallows come uh, and they and they nest and um I, once i find their nest i i go in every single day and visit them even when they're eggs and i and i uh, i get up on tiptoes and i speak to the eggs uh so that they so they get used to the sound of my voice and so that when they hatch and they hear me coming rather than like stuff themselves away in the nest they they get up and they look at me and i look at them and we and we talk um but then always comes the day that they leave which is the day that they're all sitting on the edge of the nest and i leave them for an hour and i come back and the nest is empty and i uh weep <laughs> so um this is swallows when we moved here 30 years ago, there was an old swallow's nest perched up into the corner of the darkened shed, looking like a small volcano or tiny lava clump squeezed into that private place. This summer, it seemed that everywhere there were swallows filling the air with their grace. I saw one swallow glide into the shed which is tucked away underneath the deck, just another swallow coasted out. This went on for weeks. One flew in, one out, each carrying sticks or beaks full of mud. First time in decades they've gone into the shed whose only light is a single bare bulb, and that is where they chose to build their nest. The socket into which you screw the bulb is perfectly round and flat, and that is where they crafted their nest of sticks and mud. I snuck up for a peek inside the nest, and sure enough, I counted four small eggs. I looked in every day until one day four little pairs of eyes were looking back. And then, too soon, the inevitable, they left, having shown the trust and the kind of grace that, if you're blessed, you may feel once. When we moved here 30 years ago, there were swallows that filled the air with their grace. First time in decades, they've gone in the shed. I snuck up for a peek inside of the nest of grace, where if you're blaze, blessed, you may feel the once and then the um the uh the guzzle swallows on the perch of the rim of the nest they built their nest in the shed's shadowy half light all day they carried mud out of the draft of light the socket for the bare bulb is round and metal they construct their nest on top of that riffraff of light all day long they fly in and out carrying mud. After a week, I step into the shaft of light. There atop the light socket is their little nest. I walk into the sepia and staffs of light. This slow adventure is temporal and worldly and iridescent. And when the sun chafes the light, the nest is never alone. One bird always stays. One day I peeked and saw four eggs, the waifs in light, 
and all day, every day, the flying in and out. Then one day, a tail feather, flagstaff of light. I was among the first things they would ever see. I stand beside their nest and watch them stiff in light. Their smoothest brown heads, their black eyes, their thin white mouths, the trust that shone through those black eyes in the safe light. Then the day came when they all perched on the nest's egg. The time had come to step onto the raft of light. And then they were departed and the nest empty, John standing there in awe of the grace of self-light. Um, I have one more, or do I not have time? One more? Okay. Okay. So this is, um, this is called The Trembling, and I was just reading, and I read about this place. Um, it's called Pando. Um, I think it's the one in that in the uh, in the uh, yeah in the in the anthology, and the and the uh, the um, the uh, epigraph to the first poem, which is called the trembling, is uh, this is incredible. Uh, Pando is a clonal colony of one one individual male quaking aspen located in south central Utah. It is the single living organism with a root system of 106 acres and estimated at 80,000 years old from one plant yeah from one plant poplars just like people are trembling most of the time the poplars, because of the flatness and angle of their petioles in the wind, the flatness causes tremors. The tremble we see in people, who knows? Quaking aspen, populous tremulous, contingent upon the wind to make them quiver like tethered birds struggling to fly, grove of lonely women in love, trembling, Hopkins writes, if we but knew what we do. Mona Lisa, violas, harp poachers, mere divertimente against the life's aches. Let's talk about Pando and the clonal colony of quaking aspens that have quaked for 80,000 years, grace past art. It's raining, coming down in hordes, and a man, or is it a stone? sits at the base of a tree it's a man and he's trembling colonies of poplars natural shrines tremble too and the moon weeps through rain imagine if like the poplars we all shared the same dna how we'd all quake and shimmer even changing our colors how the world would tremble with this sameness, sacrificing our leaves to the bare wind. Poplars, just like people, are trembling, most contingent upon the wind to make them. Let's talk about Pando and the clonal colonies of poplars, natural shrines, sacrificing their leaves to the bare wind. And then we'll end with um, the shimmering, which is the uh, which is the response guzzle, and the 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 pe uh, epigraph is very sad and very short from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, Pando is thought to be dying after eighty thousand years, you know, um, and we're going to lose it. It's just heart crushing. The shimmering. Beneath the earth, there is one root to get lost in. Beneath the earth, there is one root to be born in. You must see clearly these are not trees, they're 
women, women in love, searching for a grove to mourn in, their loneliness made deeper by the sparkling wind, consume such tales as if you were being sworn in. Stand 80,000 years in one spot, be patient, imagine this is the place you were first born in. How intense the need to hold on to each other. Only fingers touch in this dark, your forlorn in. How wonderful to imagine a long embrace on the ground, in the grove, reeling the gaunt moon in. I'll scramble these stories of Aspen and people. Use the round wind as a place for you to yearn in. Imagine now that everyone out there is you. John is John is John. That's the dream you will turn in. Thank you very much. Wonderful, John. Oh, my gosh. The hustle. Oh, my, my, the cat has joined us, of course. <laughs> oh, um, just amazing, the, the, the call and response aspect of the, the newer poems and the, the huzzles. I just, you, you do wonderful work in form. And I also I have to say, I love the line about the moles, how their flowers of your faces blossom into light. I just, that was tremendous. So everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, thank please, you. Thank you very um, much. Oh, please look into these poets' books. Um, either borrow them from the wonderful uh, library if they have it available, or purchase them from your local independent bookseller. Um, poets need our need our support always, and uh, also take care of your earth, of course, this Earth Week and always. And again, Lucy, thank you if you're still there. Thank you, Richfield Library. Thank you, poets. Thank you, audience members. Thank you, Margaret Gibson, uh, Connecticut poet Laura de Merida for this incredible um, anthology of, of poems um, from Connecticut poets. And I wish you a wonderful spring. Amy, Thank nice you. to see you. And Lou, it's nice to see you. And you other guys, it's nice to meet you. This, <laughs> uh, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, John. Wonderful night. Night. Thank you, Barb. Yes, absolutely. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.